Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Spring 2023 New Jersey Film Festival interview series. We've been actively doing filmmaker interviews, and today we actually have a member, a lead actor, and a wonderful feature film that we're going to be screening on February 4th called Ocean City Monster Building by Chris Lane, who's from Los Angeles, California. And today we have the lead actor, Detective Aida um, Pierre, who that's her that's her role in the film. It's Evelyn Maria Dia, and she's based in New York City in Harlem. And she's doing this Q and A with us today, so I'm so excited because I just absolutely loved your performance in this film. Well, I guess I should tell folks what it's about. The year is 1984, mm -hmm. and in a sleep a small sleepy town in upstate New York, I guess it's Rome, New York. Um, the former mayor of the city is found dead in the back street, uh, back seat of his car with a local 15 year old girl. So it's a film that touches on a lot of interesting, very contemporary issues. And I, I it deals with immigration. It deals with, you know, um, all sorts of um, women's issues, as well as uh, illicit behavior by politicians. So I think the film is very timely. I think the script was amazing. The look of the film is really kind of cool. I mean, it's not shot in widescreen. It's one, three, three to one, and it has a, a kind of washed out color look. But I, I really wanted to focus on you. And how did you get involved in this project? Uh, well, thank you for having me, first off, Dr. Alba. I really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Call um, me Al. <laughs> all right, Al. Yeah. Uh, secondly, I auditioned for it, just like we all as actors do. You know, we have either representation or we don't, and we submit ourselves for films, and this was one that my manager submitted me for, and I auditioned for it. And got, Very, and got when, when was the film shot? Uh, we shot the film last September. Wow. And I auditioned for it in June or July, between the June or July. So COVID had already started to wane. Yeah, absolutely. COVID, we were already in it and coming out of it. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. And the film is shot in Socrates, which is where Woodstock was, right? Around there? Yes. Yes. So we, we shot in Socrates. We also went to other places in New York. I think it was Midwood. Mm. Uh, we went to little small towns upstate New York, which really added, at least to my character, because as an actor, environment and location is everything. Yeah. And I appreciated that it was not the places we were at was not in my comfort zone, because to a large extent, Aida is not in her comfort zone in a lot right, of right. places. Because it's not an urban environment, it's a very rural environment. And you get that vibe from the sheriff and other people that are around that you know, you definitely seem like an outsider. Yes, correct. But but the interesting thing is that the other lead character played by Julie Joy Shin, who plays Sally, who is the adopted daughter of the mayor, Mayor Lambert, um, has come home to kind of, I guess, figure out what's happened. And we find out that there's a lot of kinship between you and her in terms of characters in the film. Um, that becomes mostly fleshed out at the end, and I definitely don't want to reveal um, the ending of the film. No spoilers allowed in our <laughs> Q&A. But, but I mean, I think, um, you know, one of the things that I wanted to ask you was that I, I, I got to check out a lot of your background before the interview, and I saw that you were an athlete at the University of Texas. And I noticed you did a lot of running in this movie. It, was that something that uh, the director Chris Lane knew and maybe wanted to use, or is it just the way that it it happened? Um, what I love about Chris, first of all, hook 'em horns for you to me. <laughs> all right. Um, what I love about Chris is Chris really took his time in getting to know who I was as a person before we actually shot. Mm. So we had about three months to prepare, and in that time, I did share with him that I was an athlete. Mm. Um, but I think Chris would have had me run either way because it was his <laughs> vision that he wanted to bring to life and he was really adamant about doing that. So yeah. yeah. I, I also thought the fact that when you came to um when your character in this film goes through a lot of different mood swings. And it, is this because the character sees herself in a difficult situation or 
I mean, how did you navigate that as an actor, having to put on various per persona? You're a detective, so you have to be the authority. But then there are moments of weakness where you are reading the diary of the of the young girl, and it seems like it touches a nerve. Was that difficult to kind of switch gears very quickly? Or I guess they were shot at different times. But um, tell us about the process. Yeah, it was a very... Um difficult process for me. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was because I had to really look at areas in my real life where mm -hmm. I feel like sometimes I do have to wear a mask. And being an African-American woman in just America, um, I can speak to the fact that there have been times when in my everyday life, I haven't felt comfortable and I felt like I've had to put up a wall or a mask just to fit in. And yeah. so that's where Aida and Evelyn is me, we meet. Mm. And so, um, but playing the role and, and seeing that, that in my real life, that's also my experience really hit me differently. It left me with the feeling like after this film is done, I want to make it a point to show up as my authentic true self, regardless as to what environment I am in. Yeah. And so, um, but transitioning from those kind of stoic wall up emo uh, moments to being vulnerable, only thing that I can think about was what do I want? What is my objective? And I think that's that is what made me feel safe enough to allow my wall to come down mm -hmm. um, in those moments when I was reading uh, her journal, Megan's journal. I think also the fact that. Um... The story unfolds very unusually. I mean, there's all of these little things that, you know, we're, we're following um, Sally as she's making her way home and she's taking the bus back from New York where she's a, a graduate student in psychology. And, and so you understand that there's something at work with her, which is not really revealed until pretty much the very end of the film. Um, and she comes home and then all of a sudden she you know, she's interacting with her mom, her adopted mom, um, and the doorbell just goes off randomly. And so that you get the sense that something's amiss in the in the film. Was that something that Chris also wanted you to have in terms of a nuanced performance? I mean, as a detective, you've got a leather jacket, you're driving a Mustang, you know, yeah. and so it's really hip, but you have to deal with all of these kind of country bumpkins. So I mean, it, was it difficult to be able to kind of turn off that perspective and then move into another? Like when you're doing this investigation, it's obvious that there's something amiss and you want to pursue it, but there's some blowback from your superiors and, and other political elements in the film. When you're dealing with that um, as an actor, is it challenging to be able to channel yourself while also trying to maintain the character's uh, image. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense, but I, I, I wondered while I was watching the film, how easy was it for you to be able to put on that mask, like you said? Mm. I think, again, it, it goes back to um, what I really came there to do. And mm. a large part of my role was really to find redemption that's what I wanted. I wanted redemption. And right. I was living that through trying to solve a case. But mm -hmm. it was so connected to my real life experience um, that that's just what I led with for mm -hmm. majority of the film. That's and the, the little like offbeat moments were definitely there intentionally because it was for uh, Aida, me in that moment, to pick up on these little clues right. that kind of built up to this you know, this climax at the end, which, right, right. you know, people will see. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I also saw that you were in an, uh, 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 an episode of Law and, Orga, Law and Order Organized Crime. How did that happen? And are, are you still doing more of that kind of stuff? Tell us a little bit about your career. Yeah, so I've been pursuing acting, if I take out COVID and the years that I took off, for seven years. Wow. Uh, I went to universe, um, University of Texas, and then after that, I came to William Esper Studios in New York. Hmm. Um, and I just got fortunate enough to get representation. And last spring, or I think it was two springs from now, I booked my first co-star role 
in Law and Order Organized Crime. Cool. Um, playing opposite of Elliot Stabler, the character in His Superior. And um, yes, I have done more work since then. I've booked two more co-star roles since then. And uh, I just see my career continue to progress as I keep staying committed and doing my work. You know, um, it's a two part fold here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's very challenging. And I must tell you that I knew Bill Esper because he taught at Rutgers. He was part of our theater program. And um, I actually there was at one point I was going I was following my vision. I, I wanted to actually be a, a French professor in literature. And I realized that I didn't like to write. <laughs> <laughs> okay. which you have to do. So I I took some film classes and I realized I really liked cinema and I I liked writing about cinema, but I feel, felt as if in order to write about cinema, you know how, need to know how to make them. So I, I went that way. But at one point I wasn't sure and I thought maybe I could follow in the footsteps of Orson Welles and, uh, you know, in, in reverse because he went from theater to film and I would go from film to theater. So I applied to the Rutgers theater program, but I realized they didn't like a lot of experimental stuff. It really is like very reality based. So it, it was short lived. They did offer me a scholarship, but I thought mm, I should stick to cinema. And that's where I ended up. And Bill Esper was teaching at that time. So wow. I thought that I, I remembered I read that also. And I said, wow, she went to Bill Esper's studio. So uh, there must be some kind of connection there. And I thought I'd bring it up. So. Yeah, he, well, as you know, he's an amazing, thorough teacher. I, I didn't study with him mainly. I had the privilege mm -hmm. of taking a few of his classes when he came in and sub. But right. um, we learned the, the basics, you know, living truthfully under imaginary circumstances. And that was my acting foundation was learning the theater way. Yeah. But as I, you know, continued in my career, I just knew that more film and TV would be the direction that I took. Yeah, it's completely different energy. You know, with theater, you you have to be very gestural and you have to be able to be seen all the way in the back of the theater. Whereas in cinema, the gestures are really much more controlled. Yes, yeah. it's, a, it's a huge adjustment. And actually one that I still am learning skills uh, to hone for, t for TV specifically, because TV is slightly different from film as well in that way yeah, where yeah. Um, if you have a, a cop show, the, the tone of it is different, that the pacing of the script is different. Mm -hmm. Whereas you have film, you can kind of really live through those moments a little more, but like you said, it needs to be more constrained and it, right, that, right. it can't be so big. Yeah, the gestation period for a film is much longer than uh, a series which is churning out episode after episode. Yeah, for mm -hmm. sure. I guess I wanted to go back to the film itself. Was what was the what was the part of making this film that you enjoyed the most? Ooh, really good question. Ah, uh, what was the part in my preparation, or like in my? You tell me. It, it's very open. I mean, I think of the process. What did you like the most? Whether it be the preparation, the actual filming. Um, the interaction with the other people on the set. I mean, you tell me. I think the the part that resonated with me the most mm. was this idea of being um, this girl's hero, mm. Julie. Um, and I, I guess it resonated with me because in real life, I love mentoring other young ladies, you know, and it just meant a lot to me to fight for her, to try to fight for her, although my intention was connected to it, but really to try to be her backbone where I knew that she she really didn't have the support. Hmm. Um, I, I love the advocating part. That's what I love the That's most. Very like cool. getting the heat for her, even if, you know, the sheriff did, you know, uh, call me names or if there was any issues of sexism, which you'll see in the film between right. him and I, it didn't matter to me. Um, so I think I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed that. Yeah, yeah. That bonding scene with you um, at uh, towards the end with um, Sandy is, is very powerful. Yeah. And I think is the kind of nodal point for the film too, in some ways. What, what was the thing that you liked the least about making this film? Oh, the, Sorry, um, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> the, I gotta say the, the discomfort mm. of, of 
like fighting to be myself when I know that I couldn't mm. uh, because I didn't feel safe to and I didn't feel welcome to. I think that was the the most difficult and to some extent a little triggering for me, mm. a little triggering for me because I've had real life experiences where that has happened. And so that was really tough to navigate. I had to be really gentle with myself mm. um, through a lot of those scenes, um, just to remain open as an actor, even in the moments that I was stoic, you know, I still have to be available, right? right? right. And so um, a mm. lot of yoga, a lot of breathing techniques and and just a, 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 this path of telling the truth, just wanting to tell the truth. Yeah, you know? yeah. So. because there's so much being covered up. I mean, in the movie itself and in real life, as we see. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Very cool. Well, I, I wanted to kind of share screen and show folks how they could buy tickets to this great movie. Let me sure. just do this and share screen. So normally folks would go to njfilmfest.com. That's our regular website. But because the festival is now a hybrid festival, I mean, as a result of COVID, everything went online. And then we discovered, thankfully, that we had an audience outside of our local realm. And that kept us afloat financially. And so we developed this new audience and we didn't want to just kind of pull the rug out from everyone once COVID was on the wane. And who knows, it may come back again in a different form. So we thought the, the logical thing would be to do both in-person screenings, as well as online screenings. So when you come to our website homepage, where if you click on current events, which just kind of rolls you down to the next um, uh, page. And this just gives you basic information. Um, the festival takes place between the 27th of January and the 19th of February on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. There are screenings at five o'clock or seven o'clock in person. And all of the films are available on, on their show date for 24 hours, which means that you can start watching at 12.01. Um, and let's say you're a late night person, you wanna start watching at 10 o'clock, you can. You still have 24 hours to finish watching. So this one is on February 4th. You start watching late night on the 4th, you have till I think 11.45 PM. Then you can start watching at 11.30 and you want to go to bed and wake up the next day, you can because you have 24 hours to finish watching it. So the key thing, though, is to click on this button. Oh, tickets are 15 bucks per program. Um, all access pass is $100, which is a great deal because it's about half price. And the $15 is good for in-person and online viewing. And we've had a number of people watch the movie during the day. They really liked it. And they knew people were coming to the screening to do the Q&A with the director or with actors or the crew members. So they wanted to interact with them and see it on the big screen. So you can do both of those things. I, we had a number of people do that quite a bit. You click on that button, it sends you to our catalog page. And so you can get all the information about all of the programs. And for Ocean, Ocean City Monster Building, you just hover over this image of uh, Julie, who's playing Sandy and um, you click on pre-order and you can buy tickets that way. Um, you can also go back to festival site, which gives you a generic overview and you can click on schedule and then you can scroll down and see all the programs that we're showing with big pictures and large text. We kind of have to do that because we're grant funded and we have to be accessible to people who have difficulty reading and other things. So we do it this way to make it easier for those folks. And as you scroll down, you'll see that there's another picture and this is of Megan's mom, um, the girl who's killed. Um, this is her mom and she goes through a har harrowing scene. And I think that scene with you and her also was pretty interesting or was it with the sheriff? I can't remember. But so you can get basic information about the schedule here. You kind of scroll back up. You can go to the film guide and it gives you basic information about all of the movies. And we have the posters that we're using. And there's a nice picture of you from the movie too. So um, it gives you cast, basic information, and you can click on select a showing and you can buy tickets that way too. So I'm gonna stop sharing and I hope I don't know. I don't know if you're able to come to the screening. I mean, I must be very honest because since COVID 
80% of our audience is an online audience. And that's why we do these Q and A's so that we can provide them with this kind of access to the makers um, because that's what we're all about supporting indie filmmaking. And we want them to get as much information as possible because our mission as being based at a university is to entertain, but also to enlighten. So um, we provide these Q and A's for folks that are not able to come, but then we do have Q and A's usually when there's artists present at the screening. So I don't know if I can, I don't know what your schedule is like, but you're always welcome to come and join us and do a live Q&A with our audience. Audiences for the live screenings vary, but sometimes there's only like 20 or 30 people in the audience and and sometimes there's a full house. So you're always welcome to join us, Evelyn. And I hope I you appreciate can. that. I will keep you posted. I will let yeah, you Yeah, know. I know you're a busy lady. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You might have a job and it's always more important to make money. So for sure. Anyway, thank you so much, folks. You want to see this great movie? It's again on uh, February 4th at 7 p.m. live or 24 hours in person. You want more information? You can go to njfilmfest.com for more information. Thanks again, Evelyn. Thank you, Al. Thank you so much.